Um, today I want to talk about uh, movement. Movement is something that's critical to what we do and I get a lot of my ideas from being environments that move on whether it's walking on a train. I always have my notebook with me and drawing, getting ideas. And I was thinking about why I get so many ideas when I'm moving and it kind of pairs with the fundamental nature of cinema where the second you turn a camera on, everything is already moving at 24 frames a second. And to me, movement is fundamental cinema. Um, it's how we tell our stories. And to me, it's something that we like to think about in a lot of different ways, how you can incorporate movement into the stories you tell. And so when you first think about movement, usually people are just thinking about camera movement. And that's really important as well. But we're also thinking in pre-production and in production about what motivates and fuels the story, how your character is moved from point A to point B throughout your film. And um, then once you put those things into place in pre-production and production, in po when you show your piece, people will be moved by the story that you tell. So we just recently finished a film called From 1994. Once we decided that we were going to make this film, um, we spent about two months in pre-production writing the script and then also doing all the things that are involved in pre-production. We had three days on set, and it was the first OV and Alexa M film ever created. So we're so going to show it for you. Yep. So the story um, is a very personal one. Casey's mom passed away in 2001 of cancer, and she was a writer. So she wrote a series of letters to Casey throughout his lifetime. Many of them were as simple as kind of a journal entry, what they did that day. And then this particular letter was um, more profound in that she was predicting what she thinks he might be like in the future, and it ended up putting it in a time capsule. And so when I originally read this letter, I thought that it was such an interesting and neat letter that I wanted to make a film about it. And so we used this letter as the basis of the voiceover for our film. And so one of my mom's dreams was to be published as a writer. And so Danielle kind of came up with the idea of wouldn't it be great to make a film to help sort of the world and people who see this film uh, appreciate her, her writing. Uh, so we took the letter and we used that for the basis of the voiceover of the film. But then we also needed a script that would basically be the framework of what we we're going to shoot. So I went back and looked at you know old photos and memories from childhood and took out uh, these moments from the letter and turn those into scenes in our film. And the first thing we did after we finished the script was uh, we went into a storyboarding phase. For me, I really like to storyboard. Um, it helps with, one, just compositions, and then two, just to get your ideas out onto the page visually. Because um, as filmmakers, we're visual storytellers. To, so to have these sort of mini frames of the framework of what you're going to shoot later is really helpful. We did uh, pretty detailed storyboards. Um, we did that just because I like to draw and it was something that was fun for me to help with ideas, getting them out. Another reason was that it helped with set design a lot. So we went back to these storyboards in set design uh, and picked out a lot of elements that were in them so we could use them. Then after Casey was done storyboarding, I took all the storyboards and put them on a big board. And since we were working with two different timelines, we were working with the mom's timeline when she's alive and the mom's timeline, or the, the older kid's timeline when she's eventually passed away, we wanted to see how those two pieces would intersect and where would be the most important places to cut back and forth. So after I put that into a kind of pre-viz uh, timeline in so with music so we could see how that would fit and next we're going to show you kind of how the storyboards matched up with shots from the film. And so this next video um, that Danielle made we brought with us on set so we could really reference back to it when we were setting up our different shots um, but these are uh, clips from our film matched up with the storyboards. So after the storyboard phase, what we had to look for location. So one thing we were looking for since we were going to be using the movie was a room uh, that was big enough to be able to wrap around the entire bed. We wanted to be able to be 
free, since the, the Mobi is so freeing in that you can do whatever you want with it, we wanted to be able to go on all sides. We're also looking for natural light so that we could have the bedroom be in natural light. We also wanted the room to have multiple different setups so that we could shoot all our different B-roll uh, opportunities in one room. And for this opening scene, we shot a lot of it as one continuous take. And from that one take, we shot some stuff under the bed, uh, panning up to reveal him in the room discovering the time capsule. And then we also shot other things of him on the bed. So for us, it was a really helpful thing when you scout to think of how many things you can actually shoot in that one location. Uh, because it really helps schedule-wise and also just footage-wise, you get a lot of things when you think about how you can break down one location to uh, help you get a lot of uh, various types of footage. Another thing we were looking for was uh, some location to fit with the line, find a secret passageway all your own. And so this house had a really beautiful closet from the 1920s that had wood, it was wood lined. And we were trying to find a good place that would have natural light. And luckily, um, this closet had natural light so he could fall nicely on his face. Because if we had to put a light in there, with the Moby coming around the corner in there, he would have either crossed the light and put shadow on our actor, or we would have had, you know, the light in the shot. So we really were happy with the natural light coming in. And that's something we would look for a lot when we're scouting, <clears throat> just from the beginning stages of when you are prepping for a film, is scout for what your story has, but also just scout for light in general, um, because it can then help tell your story better and fit in with different lines you have in your script and things like that. The next location that we were looking for was the writing scene, and we wanted to make it be nighttime and also feel very intimate. But we had the same kind of obstacle to overcome, which was we wanted to be able to shoot in all directions without having to change the lighting setup. So we ended up deciding to use all practical lighting for this particular scene. And um, so we had all the lights set up, and Casey will tell you about it. So uh, I've really, really been a big fan of shooting all practical lighting for the main reason of it just being something where the lights are sort of already built into your scene as they are naturally in when you really walk into an area. Um, one thing we really liked about lighting with all practicals in this was being able to navigate completely around the room. So this is our master shot, for example, where we had one of our lights bouncing off of the typewriter paper up back into your face. Um, and then this other light in the background was used as more of a storytelling element where we wanted to bring who she was writing to into the room, a sense of a feeling of, of the person she was writing to. So all that stuff behind her is artwork from uh, either when I was a kid or, or things we created um, for the film. We wanted to bring a sense of, of who she's writing to into it. And also if you notice, the key on her neck is the same key that was used to lock the time caps in the end. So we wanted to just bring these hints of storytelling into the scene. And then back to our lighting, we were able to swivel around to the back side of her and get a nice reverse angle uh, by just dimming down the light behind her. We had every light in the scene rigged up on dimmers, so as we moved the camera around the table, we had uh, crew members dimming different lights and making other ones brighter, uh, planned out for different shots. And that same lighting was used for the close-ups on the typewriter as well. Um, and another thing we, we thought about was, you know, she's in a dark room. We didn't want it to feel dark, we wanted it to feel warm and soft. So a lot of our lighting that we used for on her was bounce lighting. We bounced this off the typewriter paper. So it's this dark room, but things still feel soft. We didn't want a harshness to that scene. And in his room, uh, which we lit with the majority of natural light, uh, I think that when I first started learning about lighting, I was intimidated by all these lights that I thought you needed to create a beautiful image. But as we've been shooting over the years and things like that, we realized that natural light can give you so much. Um, this is the scene from that uh, room, and as you can see, it's uh, natural light falling on him, but then we have a practical light in the background. One thing that I really like about the way the Alexa captures light is not just, a lot of people talk about the dynamic range, which is amazing, but one thing is the way it captures color, and the light behind him is a tungsten light, but the light falling on him is daylight. So it works very much in the same way that our eyes do, where we see, we walk into, we don't see these drastic changes in light color. It blends them really well. And so this is another scene shooting in that same room, just utilizing natural light coming in from the window. And it resulted in this nice scene that really makes him pop uh, out from the background just by positioning uh, the light at an angle. Uh, and then we also swiveled around and got a silhouette shot of him. What I really like about this shot, and we didn't really notice this on the day of because we were looking at small monitors, but when we were grading the film, there's so much texture in the smoke. And that's something I love about that dynamic range aspect is that 
any you know other different types of cameras don't really capture that many levels of it. You can see in this the texture within the smoke and, and the different um, variations of gradation in the smoke. We graded this film uh, at eFilm and they pulled up on a big a big uh, projector screen and um, the guy in there was saying, oh wow, look at that. He, lo he loved this shot that it had so many layers of, of different texture and that was something we just kind of discovered in post um, to kind of bring that out. So the reason we wanted to use the Alexa M um, and the Moby together was, which is first, we love the Alexa. Um, we chose the Alexa M when we were purchasing a camera two years ago uh, because of the smaller form factor. And it is tied to the bigger part, but we were able to use our smaller sliders, uh, tripods, and steady cam with it. And um, when the Moby came out, we were really excited to try a new piece of technology. And what we were seeing from lots of people were these cool, epic shots that people were doing, handing off to people, running around. But when we were going to use the Moby, we wanted to see how it would work in a practical setting. What would it be like to use it on the entire film? What would it be like to have it in small moves and little intimate storytelling pieces? So that was our goal with our film, was to uh, use the Moby in a way that had we hadn't seen out there. So. Um, we thought that our film from 1994 would be perfect because it is about childhood and freedom and discovery and those things we were able to do also with the movie. And all, with the movie you're able to explore all different things. You're not tied down to a specific like being in this spot or you set up a slider and that's where it's going to be. You can kind of move in and move out. And what we found after day one of shooting was that we like to shoot in continuous takes. So we would shoot maybe a close up and then move to a wide or move into our close. And it kind of made us look at filmmaking differently. Instead of just having your wide, medium, close, we could integrate those all into one shot. We could do those all in one shot and cut it apart. And so it made us just see it in a different way. So we're going to show you uh, a clip. And this next uh, clip is we basically uh, shot a bunch from as many moving objects as we can, whether that was a person moving. Uh, this scene was particularly we shot from a golf cart. And we got a lot of great footage. But the thing to note is that when we edited this piece, uh, we took all these cuts that you'll see in this little clip and uh, put them into the edit from one take. So as we begin using this piece of technology, um, we developed this new way of shooting where we'd shoot these continuous takes and plan to get all these different shots within them. So we started with our master shot, which is one and two, and then we drove with the golf cart really, really close up next to him and got that shot of the wheel. And then we panned up to his face to get shot number four right there. And then we went a little bit in front of them and let them ride by the camera as we panned backwards down the hill to have them exit frame. I think the important thing to think about is that um, we're all here at NAB to look at new technology. And what we like to do is look at new technology and how it can help tell your story better. Because that's what it's here for. Um, technology fuels storytelling. Um, the next shot I'm going to show is uh, a shot where we were filming at the corner of a fence. And we basically just pivoted across the fence. But it was, it's a fun little shot that we kind of came up with on the day of, on the fly. So one thing to take note in that scene is just how much wind there was, and there wasn't really any, it was very, very smooth. And so that was something, you know, on, we had our one outside day, and of course we live in Seattle, it's raining, it's windy, there's all these things going on, and that didn't really affect the shooting at all. We scouted at that location six times, and all six times it was sunny, and that one day was windy and rainy. <laughs> so, um, 
just to wrap kind of back around to movement, which is the movement from 1994 that we were focusing on was character development and growth, and basically showcasing him and how he grows from the point he gets the letter to the end of the film. Then we also wanted to have physical movement, which was the, you know, him moving, doing bike scenes, running around the corner, things that showcase freedom and childhood discovery, all these things that you can do through big, nice, beautiful shots. And also camera movement. And you can make the choice of it being static. We could have done that for the writing room. It could have been completely static. But what we decided was that we we're going to do subtle movement in that scene to show be like a metaphor of her typing the letter. As the letter is being written, it's growing, it's moving, and, and building. And then there's also the emotional piece. And we've received hundreds of emails and comments that people who've had cancer or been affected by cancer and who uh, felt affected by the film. And so I think we were successful in what we were attaining to do with having the audience react in the way we wanted. So one thing I like to think about, and I would urge anyone to think about when they're developing a story, is that um, think about things conceptually. I really like to think about things like movement and pulling them into your story more than just the essence of the word, like camera movement. You can think about movement in many different ways, like defining your voice with the piece for character development as a thought process. So for us, we like to use things in the development of our stories, both metaphorically, to think about them, to help us uh, tie every camera move or, or filming technique into your story and how that better helps tell what you're trying to tell. Um, I think that in the end, it achieves the goal when you, when you focus on this stuff to uh, help the audience have a better perception of, of what you're, the message you're trying to convey.